All right, so, hello everyone. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk to you today about, I guess, some of the stuff that I've been working on uh, recently. Uh, like Max, I've also become, I guess, very excited about the prospect of teaching people programming. Um, and of course, since I'm a JavaScript guy, I use JavaScript to teach people programming. Um, so I work at uh, Khan Academy, and we're, if, if people aren't familiar, we're a, a nonprofit um, based in California, although I live here in Brooklyn. And we teach people for free around the globe. Uh, right now, most of our content is like math and science, and we have art history and some other topics. Um, and what I've been doing is I've been creating their computer science platform. So this is, so I'm trying to get people of all ages, all the way from young kids to adults, uh, interested and excited in programming and learning computer science. Um, so I got a lot of inspiration from uh, Brett Victor. Uh, I'm not sure how, how many people have seen sort of his learnable programming, like real-time stuff. How many people have seen that? I'm just curious. Good chunk. So if you haven't, I'll post the slides later. You should go check out his videos and stuff. Uh, he has some really awesome ideas about uh, uh, real-time programming. Um, so the, the big thing, uh, uh, as I said, the big differentiator between how we teach programming or, or computer science uh, compared to other solutions is that we wanted to teach people through uh, hands-on experimentation. So getting people actually coding real projects from the start. And this is something that is distinct, I think, from most other uh, ways of teaching programming. Um, additionally, we wanted to get students learning by looking at each other's code and building off of their code. So I kind of took this ideology from uh, you know, what I've learned doing open source projects. Uh, and in there, you learn by looking at other people's code, by building off that code, and then sharing it. And so I kind of wanted to take this experience and distill it down into its purest form so that people are looking at code, building projects, and then building off of each other. Um, so let's just show the platform really quick here. So this is uh, the Khan Academy Computer Science. This is a, a local version here. You can find it at khanacademy.org. I don't trust the wireless. Um, so uh, the big thing is that we are very practical. Let me just show you. This is uh, the environment. We have a code editor uh, side by side with uh, uh, the graphics. So just to show you an example, I can uh, uh, draw an ellipse. Uh, boop. Got an ellipse on the screen, you know, um, and I can fill it in uh, red. Yeah, exciting stuff. And but the interesting thing here is that um, this environment works and operates completely in real time. And uh, sh show you what I mean here. So, like for example, uh, um, if you click a number, this little slider pops up, and you can grab it and you can start to manipulate it, and you can see the results are you're represented in real time. You know, uh, uh, and, and so like, so in this case, what we're kind of doing is we're allowing, we're dropping the students into this environment and usually with some code and encouraging them to play around and to kind of intuit how things work. So this is decidedly different from other ways of teaching. So obviously we can, you can, you know, change colors. Uh, let's say a green. Um, you can do you know, all sorts of uh, uh, really fun stuff. So the you can do images. Uh -huh. Let's see here. Oh, I can. There we go. Um, and of course, you can you know manipulate manipulate them as well. Um, so the the big thing here is that the Everything that you're doing is being, again, being represented in, in, in real time. And this is actually a really, really hard technical problem. Um, and this is what I set about to tackle. Uh, this is the big thing I've been working on over this past year. Um, but, so this is a more flushed out example. So for example, we have lots of tutorials on the site. I think about 20 of them or so. 
uh, and we're, we're working on producing a lot more. And so, for example, the tutorials will cover a specific subjects. So in this case, we're teaching animation. Um, so in this case, um, you can see, again, there's the code on the left, there's the graphics on the right, and you can, of course, you know, change the code or whatever if you want the car to be a different color, you know, what, what have you. Um, but the, the interesting thing here is that there's also an audio component. So if I hit uh, play, let me see. I'll crank up the of drawings or pictures where each one is just a little hear, different it's... from the last one and flip Oops, through them fast on. enough, it'll look like your picture is moving. Back in the good old so days, they used to draw the, the, these pictures You can't really hear it, but the important so thing is that this is one of our uh, instructors, uh, Jessica, really who really is really explaining it's how to really do to make a animation. animation with code. And so I'm as she's sure. talking here, she's also going to be changing the code. I can fast forward a little bit here. So like, for example, she talks about uh, stuff, she goes through the code, she shows how to, I guess I have badges, by the way. I guess I got a badge. Um, it goes through the code and it starts to manipulate things. So the thing is here is that the big thing that we wanted, so here's the point which she's actually animating, uh, is that um, we wanted this playback to occur in the code editor itself. So we think, we feel at Khan Academy that a lecture is still an important, or at least not, not a lecture in the traditional sense, but having someone audibly explain something to you while interacting with the code is an important learning process. So this is something that, that we kind of distill here, but the important part is that it isn't a video. So this is not an immutable thing. So like while, so she's talking up there, you can pause the code and then dig in and start to manipulate things. So you can be like, oh wait, so wait, she was talking about that, but what if, you know, what if I said, you know, if X is greater than, you know, 200 and X equals zero or something like that. And then, so that, you know, that's the case where I'm like, oh, okay, so that actually worked. And you know, maybe I can add in, you know, background or something. So, so you know, but then it'd be like, okay, awesome, that was, that was sweet, that worked, but then I can go back and, you know, continue playing the, the video now. The so video, it's drawing the exactly, car. Exactly. Um, so the big thing here is, is that this, and so this is all being done with, uh, with JavaScript. Uh, this is, there's, uh, we're, we're pulling the audio off of SoundCloud, actually, uh, and playing this and syncing it up with, uh, all these commands that are happening. So if all the actions that are happening in the text editor, uh, the, the presenter can actually draw on the right-hand side as well if they want. Um, it, I'm not sure how many people are here are familiar with Rick Waldron's uh, uh, PopcornJS. It's sort of like that, only even crazier. Um, and so th this is definitely some very cool stuff that uh, um, I'm, I'm very proud of. So the big thing here is that when you create a new project. So let's say I love this project for some reason. Uh, uh, so I call it Green Circle with Dude. Uh, I hit Save. Uh, uh, it saves my project. Now the big thing is that um, everything that you save is is you know published uh, uh, online. Other people can access it, and you can go in um, and manipulate this. Well, let me actually go in here. Mm -hmm. Let's, go, let's look at an existing one. So one of the big things is that we have lots of pre-made programs. So like, you know, we have you know, ones based off math, you know, user interaction drawing, uh, a bunch of simulations and games. Um, so for example, let's say, this, this is a, a crude little game here called uh, Jump Girl. Let me show you. So this is built uh, um, by one of the interns uh, this summer. So in this game, you can see the little Little person hopping around. Yeah, you know, so like the, the entire logic for this game is contained uh, uh, within here. And the cool part about this is that you can, since it since it's working in real time, you can, you know, manipulate this completely. So let's go back here. Uh, let's say I want to make this a bridge. You know, I can start to, yeah, da, 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 da. and then you know, I can go over here. And now I have like a little bridge to walk across. So again, so this is. This all occurring here in the game. So I think that the, the issue is, is that most real-time editors I've seen, um, what they'll do is they'll completely re-execute all the code again. 
And the problem is, is that if you do that, it breaks sort of the, the seamless nature of what programming should be, I feel. Because here, like, you know, I wanted to add in a, in a couple additional blocks to make a bridge or something. And in order to do that, you know, I wanted, I needed my person to be over here so I could actually see the blocks, so I could see them being built. But the problem was is that if it was a traditional environment where it's constantly running again and again, like my guy would keep getting reset back to the beginning and I'd be back over here again, I'd have to walk back over and see the result and keep going back and back again, which is really annoying. Um, so what we're actually doing is we're doing some dynamic injection of code live while the code is running. Um, so th I'll talk more about how we do that because it's, I, I think it's, it's particularly exciting. Um, so this is, so, and again, of course, you can go in and, you know, for example, uh, uh, let's find the image here. Hmm, there's tiles. Okay. And maybe we can change to, there we go. So there, I have a different character now. So, uh, so let's say I just changed that. Uh, I'm going to call it jump girl two with bridge. And so if you notice now, on all the programs on the site, there is this save as button at the bottom. What we've kind of done is we've kind of turned, uh, uh, let's say, Git's or GitHub's forking into effectively save as. So anytime you see a program, you have the ability to save it. And here I can save it to my profile. But now this is a fork from that original. And we keep the full kind of fork hierarchy uh, that goes on here. So you can see, uh, I guess down here at the bottom, it says, you know, created by dude less than a minute ago, but based on uh, Jump Girl. So you can, so essentially this is the, the same thing as GitHub's, you know, this is where it's been, been forked from. So we kind of wanted to introduce this concept of, again, being able to build off of each other's work, but being able to see that lineage as well um, so that was a, a big thing we've, we've kind of, you know, uh, baked in here. So just to kind of uh, 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 jump back here. Um, so, so far with this platform, uh, we've had a lot of students uh, uh, making projects. Uh, right now, there's been 116,000 fort projects, so fort from an existing one. Uh, uh, we, so again, we're, we're calling it fort internally, but we don't actually ever say fort to the students since it sounds a little bit angry. But, um, and then we also have uh, about 40,000 new projects created and 5.8 million views. So this is really exciting. It's only been out now for, I guess, about two months. Um, so yeah, so again, like we're effectively GitHub in disguise. You know, a very simplified version here where the IDE and all the revision control is completely in line and you know, in this platform. Um, so all the implementation of this is, uh, like I said, it's all JavaScript. So we're using uh, no Canvas uh, naturally. Uh, we're using processing JS as our API for drawing. Uh, this is this is nice because it sits as a nice layer in between uh, 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 the rather harsh Canvas API that typically exists, and it provides a much much better API in my opinion. Um, so pretty much what we do is we, in, so processing itself, uh, uh, there's two components to it. There is the processing sort of API, which is like stuff like, you know, uh, draw an ellipse, draw a rectangle, fill some color, stuff like that. That's what we're using. But there's also the processing language, which is a Java-ish language, uh, which we do not use. We much prefer to use uh, uh, JavaScript in this regard. And what's interesting is that uh, we've been using this platform, platform we, we've been testing it on a lot of people, including very young kids. Um, so I'm trying to think the youngest that we've tested on, probably about eight or, or so, but I've gotten reports from parents who are using it with kids who are five or six. Um, and even in those cases, we, we don't explicitly say in giant letters that this is JavaScript, they're using processing and stuff like that. We just, we present them with this environment we give them a brief tutorial to say, you know, this is roughly how it works, now give it a try. And we found that with that very basic instruction and with documentation there, the students are able to effectively teach themselves. Um, and this is a really cool thing to watch 
Uh, and so this summer, I, I actually uh, helped teach in a classroom of middle schoolers, or grade schoolers and middle schoolers, um, and using this platform. And it was awesome to see them come in and having no programming experience whatsoever. Uh, uh, and also, uh, I think as, as Mary pointed out earlier, not the best keyboard abilities, and, uh, you know, like, like you know, dealing with punctuation and stuff like that. Even with that, uh, they go from nothing to doing like animations in about an hour and a half. Um, and, that's, and that's with no teacher instructor. That's with like setting them down and just having them explore and do things. So this is something I'm like really excited about. I'm really proud of that we're able to get them uh, 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 to this sort of level. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the real-time execution, because this is something that is uh, uh, technically very, very hard to do, but uh, I think it's really cool. Um, and it uses some features in the browser, uh, which are going away in newer versions of the ECMAScript, uh, which make me sad. So I wanted to talk about them. Um, so the big thing, as I mentioned before, is that you know, while the program is running, you can change these values. Uh, you can change the code, and the code will continue the run. Uh, um, just to kind of just jump back here, I just want to uh, emphasize it. Let me make a let me make a new program here. So let, let's say I wanted to make a, a ball that was going to animate across the screen. Um, so. In, in processing, you, there's a draw loop, and it's constantly called over and over again. Uh, so in this case, I'll you know, draw my ellipse. I'll draw, start off on the left-hand side. And I've got to add in a variable. Ooh, exciting stuff. X. And then once I say X plus one, there we go. Now that's going to be animating. So we have a black background there, but that's because we aren't we don't have a background, we have that. So you can see here, like the ball never stops moving. It just keeps going, and I can, I can see this working. So let me see here if I say, if x is greater than, uh, let's say, 400, uh, then let's start it going backwards. We need a direction then. All right, so, uh, but let's say, like, I, I, as I'm going here, I'm like, oh, shoot, I don't want it to be red, you know, I want it to be purple, because that's awesome. Or I guess the background, let's, let's change the fill to something else. So the, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, I, I feel like being able to manipulate these things is, is such a powerful uh, 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 concept in, in, in not having this, the jolt. What I like is that what you see on the left is always a representation of what you see on the right, always. So, so uh, I guess I haven't showed a broken program yet, but let's, you know, let's say I accidentally left off a semicolon. Uh, in this case, we pop up uh, uh, an error dialog, and we actually do, uh, uh, we, we actually try to provide very helpful errors, error messages to the, to the programmers. Because we found, and I think most of us have experienced, that much of the frustration of learning to program is in the really cryptic error messages that you receive. Um, you get, and so what we've actually done is we've actually provided an extra level of debugging on top of the, uh, we, use, we use JS hint to do the, the initial pass. And, and then we, uh, we provide an additional level that provides even more information about what's actually going on. Um, so for example, let's say, so I have x plus equals uh, uh, direction here. Let's say I have, um, let's say I mistyped dar, or dir, as I said, D-A-R a D -A -R or something, I don't know. Um, and then, uh, or maybe, uh, maybe like, um, uh, dit, I don't know. Um, in, in this case, it, it, start, it tries to give you spelling suggestions. Uh, so we're, we're, it's like, in this case it says, do you mean distance of a dit? Um, but maybe let's say, um, uh, instead of lips, let's say a list. We, we, we've actually found that when students were using this, that they, were, they had a lot of trouble initially with like spelling some common things, like background. They almost always left off the G. 
they said background, which is kind of how it sounds. But, uh, but so, so here, here's an example of like we typed ellipse, but we missed the P, and, that, and it gives a suggestion that you need to type ellipse instead of a list. Um, so, the, and we found that like stuff like this is actually uh, uh, just very helpful. That like it, it can't be understated how important good error messages are to a student's ability to learn. Um, so with this real-time execution, again, we're not just straight evaluating the code. We have to re-inject it here. And I wanted to sh show, just kind of describe briefly how this injection works. So as I mentioned before, we, we pass all the code through JS hint initially. Every time, it's actually every time a keystroke occurs, we're passing code through JS hint. Um, and this is just an analyze and make sure that any major errors are, are taken care of in the code. Um, if, the, there are, if there are errors, then we go off to our separate error hint module, which we call baby hint, uh, lovingly so. Um, at which point, we now uh, uh, take the code and run it in a worker thread in the background. We use a lot of worker threads in, in this, and this is how we, we stay you know, uh, uh, rather performant. So the big thing is that we run the code in the worker thread, we do this to actually watch for never-ending loops. Um, so, like, so this is interesting because, like, let's say, uh, let's make a new program here. Um, uh, let's say, I'll just make a whole bunch of circles. I think. There we go. So yeah, I'm just drawing a whole bunch of ellipses across, and I'm drawing uh, at an interval starting at zero, going up 20 every time. But let's say I'm like, I'm going to go change, I'm going to go change this. I'm like, oh, what happens if I do plus equals zero? At which point, normally the browser would just completely barf on you, and it would freeze, and you'd be stuck, and it would die. Um, but what we do now is we pop up a dialog saying your program is taking too long to run. Maybe you made a mistake. You, you can fix it. But the nice thing is that it's not frozen. I can go back and be like, oh, I meant, I meant 30. And then yeah, I, can, I can fix that. So we actually do this by running the code in a worker thread, looking for it to be executing for too long. And if that's the case, we provide helpful error messages back to uh, the, the student. So uh, that's something where, um, I'm also uh, very proud of. Um, so when we're executing the code, uh, uh, so this, this is after going through the worker thread. Um, we execute the code. The very first time it runs, we just straight eval it. And then, but the interesting thing is that when we eval it, we extract all the state from the current runtime. Um, this is a, a, a really cool. So let me show you an example here. Uh, I mentioned this. Um, so we use uh, uh, lots and lots of with statements because I love them. And, but no, more appropriately, uh, this is the only way it can work. Um, so, for example, just a, a brief primer on, on, on with statements. You can take an object, pass it into with, and inside the scope of the with statement, you can access the object properties as if they were uh, uh, global variables. Um, so, in this case, we have this object. We set you can concatenate on the name. We set the city property. Both of those things are set on that object. An interesting side effect of with uh, statements is that, in this case, I appended var in front of these variables. So I said var city equals Brooklyn, var job equals Khan Academy. In those cases, it still goes on to the object. So even though you're declaring a new variable, the variable is still extracted and put onto the object. Some might say it's a bug, I say it's a feature. Um, okay, so this is an, uh, so this is where sort of the, the beauty of the platform comes out. So let's say you know ahead of time that someone is going to declare a variable job. So in this case, here we, we add a new property, job, uh, just set it to undefined. It's just, it's just undefined, but it exists. Um, and then here you set var job equals Khan Academy. You can see here that Khan Academy is extracted again. It's slurped up into this object and it's held there. This is effectively what we're doing with the code in, in the Khan Academy platform. We wrap it all in an object. So what we do is we, we go through uh, uh, 
JSM. We run the code through JSM, and JSM has a very interesting property, which is it tells you all the global variables that exist in this code. Because of that, we can go through and be like, oh, you have a global variable named name and job and draw and all these things. So what we do is we set properties of undefined. So like, you know, we have name undefined, job undefined, draw undefined. And then when the program runs, we suck up all these variables into this object. But this allows us to effectively have a global object that we can then pass around from execution environment to execution environment. So this means that all these global variables are captured and, and maintained. So just for example here, we have this program, very simple program, var x equals 5, y equals 1, var draw equals a function. Very simple. So JS hint passes. Uh, uh, it passes our, our, our never-ending loop detection. Um, and then the code is evaluated. And now what happens is that after the code is evaluated, we get this object back, which essentially has all the values of the program in it. It has x of 5, it has y of 1, it has draw of a function. Now note that with all these value, values, they are in a, a, a serialized form. They're all in a, as, uh, serialized as a string. Now what happens is, let's say we take this program and we go from var x equals 5 to var x equals 50. So the, the, the user just typed a 0. Uh, in this case, again, the code runs. The code is evaluated, but this time what happens is that we have the, uh, we, we extract the values from the code. So uh, I should mention that when we run the code, but we don't let it draw on the screen. So this is like a separate copy of the code that's running off on its own little sandbox doing its own thing. So we let it run, we extract the new values out, we compare it with what the old values were, and then if something changed, so in this case, we see that uh, uh, x became 50 instead of 5. But because of that, we now, the only code we actually evaluate at the end is var x equals 50. That's the only code that we run inside the environment, because we know that that's the only thing that's changed. Um, so again, so something more complicated, let's say we change inside of this function. We, we change var x plus, plus equals y times 2. We made it times 2 now. Again, same thing happens, we run the code, we serialize the, uh, 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 the draw variable, and then we only inject the new draw function. Now the real beauty of this is, you can see down here, we're evaluating var draw equals this function. What's so awesome about this is that it maintains all the closures that currently exist in the environment. So it's referencing the copy of x and y that are in the live environment not what was uh, uh, typed previously. So all this is being injected live, closures are being maintained, and I, I don't have enough time to go into it, but it also handles uh, objects, uh, uh, function prototypes, it handles inheritance, and it handles all of them, doing them, injecting them dynamically as well. Uh, so this is something I'm, I'm really proud of. It's like, it's really complicated, and it's, uh, it's interesting because I, I watched Brett Victor's talk uh, where he kind of demonstrates some of this stuff uh, in a very theoretical manner. Um, but uh, I, as I started to watch it again and again, I realized what he built probably wasn't possible to be actually, I don't think you can actually build it. And I realized that, that there is a subset that is very powerful that we can build that does match a lot of generic use cases, especially for people learning uh, how to program from, from a basic up to, let's say, a, a beginner advanced level. Um, that this use case worked very well for. And it's interesting because like, we've had a number of people use this platform all the way from young kids who have found it very engaging and uh, uh, all the way up to adult experienced programmers. And it's interesting because like, we actually, um, we use this in the office with a whole bunch of, we have like a hack day where everyone at Khan Academy just sat down and was like, we're gonna build stuff. We're gonna build simulations, we're gonna build games. There's all sorts of stuff. And so the feedback that we got from experienced programmers uh, was, was that this is the most fun they've had programming in years. And, uh, and it's really fun because like uh, uh, Ben Kamen's our lead developer was like, he, he always builds a, 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 a Boyd simulation. Let me f see if I can find it. Um, uh, there we go. Like, like a Boyd's, like a flocking birds uh, simulation. 
Um, and he said he, every time he learns a new programming language or a new environment, he always builds a bird simulation. And so you can kind of see here, they have the birds flock, and you can hit them with a rock, it's because it's fun. And um, so you, again, you can see the full code, and you can manipulate it. And he said that every time he visits a new environment, he tries to write this thing, and he said it's, he's never, it's never been easier than this. And, and in this case, he, he, knew, he didn't know processing at all. He, uh, you know, he's, his JavaScript is probably kind of rusty, but like, I mean, this, and, and, and again, like, and this is some, again, I, I'm very proud of it, that um, it can be so engaging where we can have middle schoolers learning how to do animation in an hour and a half on their own, and, you know, all the way up to experienced programmers having just a really fun time becoming excited about programming again. Um, so this is, so again, this is a very welcome tour of, of the sort of stuff that we're working on. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Thank you. <laughs>